Uh, my name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing at the Kansas City Public Library. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight as we launch a new series with our good friends at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. Our focus this time, turning points. Uh, we wanted to take a closer look at some key moments in history, uh, be they events such as the launch of Sputnik and the race to control space, years such as 1979, the year that changed the Middle East, or as is the case tonight, decisions such as America's decision to provide billions of dollars in aid to Germany following World War II. Imagine, if you will, life in Germany at the end of World War II. Millions were homeless due to Allied bombing campaigns across the country. The transportation system was virtually non-functional. Citizens who had been evacuated were returning by foot to find that their homes had been destroyed. If you're a woman, you might not know if your husband was dead or alive. And even if you could prove that your husband was dead, good luck collecting any benefits because there was no German government. There wasn't a great sense of urgency on the part of the Allies to provide relief to the nation that had terrorized Europe for six years. But at the direction of Harry S. Truman, the United States eventually poured billions of dollars into Germany's recovery as part of the Marshall Plan. Tonight, we welcome David Mills to explain why that decision was a turning point in history. How difficult was it? Were there ulterior motives? And could anyone in the United States government at the time have predicted that 70 years later, Germany would be such a close military and economic ally? An associate professor in the military history department, David Mills holds a doctorate in history from North Dakota State University and is the author or co-author of three books, two of which, Great Wartime Escapes and Rescues and Operation Snowbound, he has discussed at the Kansas City Public Library. All told, this marks David's fifth Kansas City Public Library programming. And honestly, he's good enough that I would sign up today for another five if I could. Please welcome David Mills. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, greetings, everybody. Hey, I'm Dave Mills. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. It's always great to be at the Kansas City Public Library. Uh, so this presentation is a summary of a book project that I'm finishing up finally uh, on this often overlooked topic. Uh, so this presentation is about feeding Germany after World War II, generally the three years between 1945 and 1948. But as the comedian Ron White says, before I tell you that story, I have to tell you this one. So let's go back to 1914 and the start of World War I. Germany invades through Belgium to get to France and immediately Britain, uh, Great Britain sets up a blockade against Germany. You can uh, see where the, the blockade line is on this map. Germany had imported about 20% of all the food they required before the war. So when the blockade cuts off their food imports, they simply take whatever they need from Belgium uh, to make up the difference. Before the war, Belgium had imported about 70% of all of the food that they required before the war. But now Belgium starves. Oops. All right, so enter into the, comp into the, into the conversation Herbert Hoover. He's a multimillionaire, having earned millions of dollars uh, in his mining ventures throughout the world. However, he's mostly known for the terrible economic policies that he enacted during the Great Depression as the president. But he's one of the greatest humanitarians in history. He forms an organization called the Commission for the Relief of Belgium, and he negotiates with Germany, France, and Great Britain, all nations at war, to bring American food into Belgium to relieve the suffering there. Surprisingly, the Germans allow the food into the, into the country, and they don't steal it. Later, Hoover is the head of the United States Food Administration, an organization charged with providing food for the U.S. Army. In November of 1918, the war comes to an end. One of the reasons for the German surrender was this blockade. The Germans at home are starving. After the war, the British keep the blockade in place to punish the Germans for the deaths of millions of French and British soldiers and to force them to sign this punitive peace agreement, the, the Versailles Peace Treaty. President Woodrow Wilson strongly objects to punishing the Germans after World War I, uh, and as he believes it will bring about a bigger and deadlier war later on, but he's overruled, turns out. 
Spoiler alert, he was right. Half to three quarters of a million Germans starved to death as a result of this blockade, of which about 300,000 Germans starved to death after the end of the war. With Belgium able to import food, uh, food now, he turns his attention to Germany. Hoover forms the American Relief Administration to administer aid to f and, uh, and bring food to Germany as soon as the British lift the blockade in July of 1919. But Hoover's not done with his humanitarian missions because there's a famine in the Soviet Union uh, between 1921 and 1922. Hoover mobilizes the American Relief Administration to switch aid from giving food to Germany to giving food to, to Russia. Although the famine is over by 1923, many Americans had objected to feeding the communists. After all, the Red Scare uh, is going on in the United States where people are terrified that communists were going to take over the country. And in response, Hoover says this. He says, we must, take, we must make some distinction between the Russian people and the group that have taken over the government. I think you will need to separate in your mind the 200,000 communists in Russia from the 150 million Russian people. Oops, that didn't go how I planned. Sorry. So between 1914 and 1923, Hoover distributes a total of $3 billion in food relief to various nations measured in 1923 dollars. And historians estimate that he probably saved somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million lives, of which 9 million were children. But here's the important point. Feeding starving nations was important to Americans because it's in our value system to do so. We don't like to see people suffer. But just as importantly, it's in our interests to do so. Uh, we want to prevent the spread of communism at this time, which thrives in darkness and misery. So people will trade their freedom for food. As one of my students once said, where values and interests intersect, this is where action happens. So now that we have a little better understanding of starvation around the turn of the 20th century, let's go back to Germany and talk about those results of the punitive peace. In sum, the, the Versailles Peace Treaty has devastated Germany. Germany has no military. They're forced to accept blame for starting the war, and they lose territory to the victors. Germans must pay reparations as well. In other words, they have to pay the entire cost of the war, at least for the, the French and the British, particularly. They say that it is impossible to put a price on human life. Well, the Allies did it, and they handed a bill to the Germans. Having to pay the Allies' reparations had crippled the German economy. So can you see what the, the you probably can't tell what the woman in the, in the left-hand picture is doing. She's actually burning money because it's worthless. In 1918, one German mark was equal to one American dollar. By July of 19, 1923, one American dollar is worth four trillion marks. Imagine going to the grocery store and having enough cash with you to buy groceries, or imagine driving up to McDonald's and ordering off their dollar menu and having to have four trillion dollars in cash to pay for your burger. So as a result of the Versailles Peace Treaty, Germany is shattered financially, politically, and they're humiliated. What do you want more than anything if you are a German in the 1920s and the 1930s? You probably want somebody who's going to lead you out of this problem. It's important to remember that Adolf Hitler was elected to head the government. He didn't overthrow the German government to take control. He immediately starts to rearm Germany when he comes to power in 1933, and the Allies do nothing. The majority of German people are thankful that a strong person has risen to the highest ranks of the German government. As many predicted, World War I was not the war to end all wars. It was the opening round for a bigger and deadlier war, just as Wilson and many others had predicted. 
World War II starts when Germany invades Poland in 1939. They invade France in 1940. They invade the Soviet Union in 1941. Hitler had conquered much of Western and Central Europe, murdering citizens there for various offenses and stealing the food to feed his army and to send home to Germany. The United States will get involved in the war after Pearl Harbor in 1941. And even though the nation wants revenge for Japan, the Roosevelt administration settles on a Europe first policy. The world could not tolerate a, a Europe dominated by Adolf Hitler. So this is an interesting map. Take note of all of the nations that Germany occupied or had conquered. Like the previous war, Germany had done nothing to substantially invigorate their agricultural productivity. So German farmers still can't feed their own population, and they still imported about 20% of the food needs before the war. But once the war started, they simply took whatever they wanted from the nations that they conquered, including slave labor, food, and anything of value. Once they had finished conquering Russia, they had planned to put German farmers into Eastern Europe, sending all of that food to Germany and starving over a million Russians to death. But they lose the war too quickly for that plan to work out. As the slide says, this is the high tide of German conquest. By 1943, they're retreating back towards Germany for the rest of the war. And then we all know what happens with the Holocaust. So there's no sympathy for Germany when they unconditionally surrender in 1945. As we know, Germany loses the war and has numerous problems after it. Many Germans are soon starving since they're their farmers can't provide all of the food that they require, and they can't steal from their neighbors any longer. To make matters worse, since the Soviets take land from eastern Poland, the Poles then take land from eastern Germany in return. This matters because Germany loses its most productive farmland. At the same time, millions of ethnic Germans are thrown out of eastern Europe, and millions of slave laborers are already in Germany when the war ends and they all come to the western zones. So when uh, the war ends, there's 25% less farmland, and the Allies have 10 million more people to feed in the nation that, even in the best of times, had imported 20% of all of their food needs. Also note that Germany is occupied by the four powers to ensure that Germany does not rise again militarily. So let's take a quick look at this, at this map. So this area, over here in the east, used to belong to Germany. It's now, as you can see, divided between the Soviets and the Poles. This is the area that I was talking about, which is the most productive German farmland. It now belongs to the Poles. And this is Germany. And it's divided up into occupation zones by the four powers. Here's the Soviet zone in the east, the British zone in the north, the French in the west, and the American zone in the south. President Roosevelt didn't have a plan to feed Germany at the end of the war. In fact, he had no plan for the occupation. Somebody who did have a plan was Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, which for some strange reason the plan was called the Morgenthau Plan. Morgenthau wanted a harsh, a harsh peace for Germany. His plan included taking all of the industry out of Germany and making a nation of dirt poor farmers. The Soviets and the French loved the idea because they wanted to take all of the German factories and send them back to their home countries and ensure that it never rose again militarily. The plan leaked to the press, probably by some State Department employee who hated the plan. Uh, but this encouraged the Germans to fight longer and harder uh, than they probably would have. The British absolutely hated the plan, condemned it, said we will never go along with this idea. And the American people hated the idea also. They were not f fans of retribution, even for their former enemies. The Morgenthau plan was scrapped in October of 1944, but there's nothing to replace it until after the war. So with no real plan, everybody is focused on victory, not on peace. So when the war ends, the Germans are starving. The U.S. Army is feeding Germany out of excess rations, but this is not a long-term plan. 
Can you see what's happening in this picture? It's a little blurry because it's a copy of a copy. But in the, uh, on the left-hand side, these are German citizens here, and these are American GIs, and these are the pots and pans that the German citizens have placed for the, the GIs to scrape the remnants of their meals off into these pans so that the Germans have something to eat. Now, for their part, the American GIs usually go through the chow line two, three, four times, and then when they come out, they scrape all of the, uh, all of the meals into the, into the pans to give the Germans some, something to eat. But this isn't a long-term plan, but um, I suppose that's why we're here tonight, to talk about what happens. All right, so all of Europe is hungry after World War II, particularly the Dutch after a brutal occupation by the Germans. On the left-hand side here is nine-year-old Henke Holvast, a Dutch boy who had the habit of t carrying a spoon with him wherever he went, just in case, as he always said. On the right is General Lucius Clay. Sorry. On the right is General Lucius Clay in charge of the German occupation in the American zone. And he's given a new occupation plan called JCS 1067. Truman signed it in June of 1945, a month after the German surrender. The plan is vague, but it gives, gives Clay a lot of leeway. And he also understands that people have to eat. He says, there's no choice between being a communist on 1,500 calories a day and being a believer in democracy on 1,000. However, he had problems convincing Truman that he needed food early on. German agriculture could only provide about 1,000 calories per day to German citizens, most of whom are, are living in urban areas. And excess military rations are providing up to 500 calories per day. So between 1945 and 1948, 1,500 calories per day is the goal that we don't often meet uh, for, to provide for German citizens through a combination of German agricultural production and allied food shipments. So Truman is determined not to make the same mistakes that the British and the French do after World War I. America had more influence after World War II and had a huge say in the peace process. The peace that Truman envisioned was difficult, but not harsh or punitive. However, he didn't understand that Germany was starving or how desperate the situation was and how starvation is going to play into the entire occupation plan. So this new occupation plan said that Germany could not produce heavy industrial goods to export. They could produce enough light industrial goods to meet German demand, but they can't export that either. The Allies were terrified that the Germans were going to enjoy a higher standard of living than their neighbors who were victims of Nazi aggression. Thus, they couldn't produce anything to sell to make money to purchase food. The Allies were still concerned with Germany rearming at this point, and upon hearing of the occupation plan, one member of Clay's staff, a former investment banker from New York, he said this, this thing was assembled by economic idiots. It makes no sense to forbid the most skilled workers in Europe from producing as much as they can for a continent which is des desperately short of everything. So remember, after World War I, the exchange rate was four trillion marks to a dollar. That's not much, but at least it did have some sort of a measurable value. But after World War II, the mark didn't even establish that. It, was sim it simply had no worth. In place, of a function of, diagram, sorry. in place of a functioning economy and a viable currency, people traded goods. A black market rose up, and if there was a currency, it was cigarettes and chocolate bars. People didn't use paper money. Remember, it's, it's worthless. Farmers wouldn't bring their, their produce to market to trade for worthless cash. People in the rural areas ate reasonably well as farmers kept a lot of the food that they grew for their families and for their communities, while people in the cities starved. Rather than work, people went to the countryside looking for food, or they were so starved that they couldn't work at all. Like the Roosevelt administration, the Truman administration had no plan to feed Germany after the war. They didn't understand how short of food Germany was, 
and that their thought was, hey, Germany has started this war, and if they go hungry, that's the price of doing business. They also assumed that Germany could provide all of the food that, uh, from their own agricultural production that their population would need. So it's easy to say that you don't care if somebody starves. It's quite another to watch it happen. And this is a reflection of our values and our interests. Our values dictate that we won't allow people to suffer, and the Truman administration made a determined effort for the three years after the war to provide for the Germans. And as the Cold War begins to heat up, it's our interests lie in not allowing communism to flourish due to food shortages. We had to provide food for the German people. All right, I know this is a bit of an eye chart. I'm not going to quiz anybody on what any of the, uh, what any of the values are. Uh, I didn't, don't really expect you to be able to read it, but it's, it's worth mentioning, so I put it up here. The American Army begins a weighing program in their zone of occupation to keep an eye on the overall health of the Germans living there. They would simply stop people in the streets and ask them to step on the scales. If you can tell, their sample size was, was quite large, probably about 15,000 people per month uh, that they weighed. And there are six groups, including men or women, between the ages of 20 to 39, 40 to 59, and people over 60. So these weights are given in kilograms, which makes for a bit of mental gymnastics, but I've done a bit of conversions for you and the results are interesting. The war years were hard on Germany. Men aged 20 to 39 averaged just 132 pounds uh, in August of 1945. But as a group, they had lost six pounds over the next two years. In the same time frame, men aged 40 to 59 weighed just 127 pounds to start with and lost two pounds over the next two years. Men over 60 years of age weighed 129 pounds in August 1945, but had lost seven more pounds over the next two years. Women aged 20 to 39 averaged just 113 pounds in August of 1945, uh, and had gained three pounds over the next two years. Uh, women uh, aged 40 to 59 averaged 114 pounds to start, but had gained one pound over the next two years, and women over the age of 60 started at 112 pounds, but lost four pounds over these next two years. So there's many reasons that women could gain weight and men could not. So the simple answer was that many German women were engaged in prostitution at the time. The going rate for sex with a German woman was five cigarettes or a chocolate bar. Women had particular family situations as well. They often didn't work outside the home and they often uh, were responsible for finding food for their families. And men would sometimes bring food home from their jobs and share with their families. In summary then, immediately after the end of the war, Germany has two problems concerning food. First, they can't produce enough of it to export, or sorry, they can't produce enough industrial goods to export to pay for food. And second, German farmers are not producing enough food, and what they are producing, they're not sending to urban areas. Farmers eat well, and they're not willing to exchange their goods for worthless money. On the other hand, people in the cities often travel to the countryside to trade family heirlooms for food. Other European nations are getting agriculture back on track in 1945, but Germany is starving, and their economy is still broken. All right, so finally, by December of 1945, the Truman administration finally understands the situation in Germany. Unrest will lead to food riots and an embrace of communism, and they must start sending food to Germany. The good news is that the U.S. wheat crop in 1945 broke all previous records, and the Truman administration is eagerly awaiting a report from the Department of Agriculture telling them how much food or how much wheat the Americans have in inventory so they can determine how much to send to Germany. The bad news is that most of the grain from the 1945 harvest was already fed to livestock to help alleviate the nationwide meat shortage. People had lost lots of, uh, had made lots of money in the war effort, which had pulled the United States out of the Great Depression. 
And working at defense factories and other jobs paid really well uh, during and, and right after the war. People wanted meat, which they couldn't get during the Great Depression, and they were willing to pay top dollar for it. So there's not much grain available to ship to Europe or, or to Germany. At the same time, a worldwide famine hits, as luck would have it. Everybody is short of grain. So who are you going to call to fix your food problems in 1946? Well, Truman calls on Herbert Hoover to help find food for Germany. Hoover suggests creating an organization that will inform Americans of the urgency of the situation and get Americans to voluntarily help solve the problem. It had worked during World War I, why wouldn't it work now? Truman likes the idea and he creates the Famine Emergency Committee. He selects 12 prominent Americans to serve on the executive committee and 125 citizens to serve as organization members whose job is to spread the word about the need to save grain in their hometowns and cities. Truman called on every governor to help spread the word as well, and there are lots of radio advertisements and billboards uh, reminding people to save grain. The main idea was to get Americans to give up one slice of bread a day, plus cakes, pies, and other food containing grains, and save it for shipment to Germany. The downside of this program was that it was all voluntary, which was its greatest vulnerability. Overall, the project was not very effective. People couldn't see how giving up a slice of bread uh, per day would help feed an entire nation. But Hoover also took a trip around the world looking for grain. He talked to some national, he's talked some national leaders out of importing grain who didn't really need it. He talked other national leaders into giving up grain that uh, probably had extra on hand anyway. At Hoover's request, he meets with the Pope in the Vatican. At Hoover's request, the Pope broadcast a message to South America, asking Catholics there to give up grain for Europe, which Hoover said was very effective. America doesn't have great relations with Juan Perón in Argentina at the time, but um, Hoover convinces him to give up enough grain to keep Germany from starving. This meant the Germans had access to the same 1,500 calories per day. All of this effort was simply to maintain this minimal amount of food. As one German said, the food provided was not enough to live on, but it wasn't enough to die on either. After a tough 1946, everyone was banking on 1947 being a much better year. And again, the American wheat harvest broke all records. And again, the American farmer is feeding a whole lot of it to, to livestock. In addition, the, uh, the American corn crop was severely damaged by floods in the Midwest. And um, on top of that, the European harvest was devastated by cold weather. So the, the U.S. had pulled out all of the stops the previous year to send 450,000 bushels of wheat to Germany in 1946. Now they needed to send 100,000 more bushels over and above what they had sent the year before just to avoid starvation. And again, this is just to maintain that 1,500 calories per day. At the same time, relations with the Soviet Union was at an all-time low. The Americans and the British ignored the Soviet and, and French desires and began to set up the Western zones and, and the creation of Western Germany. They begin to set that stage. So the key to successfully creating the nation of West Germany was economic reconstruction. The key to economic reconstruction was food. Instead of minimizing manufacturing, the U.S. began encouraging German manufacturing in 1947. JCS 1067 was replaced by JCS 1779. Not that the numbers are important, but this new plan authorized the production of steel and iron to export to pay for imported food. But here's the problem. Even though manufacturing was now encouraged, workers didn't have enough calories or strength to make production possible. Here's why starvation prevented economic recovery in 1947. 
In 1944, Dr. Ansel Keys from the University of Minnesota begins a starvation study to understand how it affects the human body. And the Army wants to understand how starvation will affect the occupation. Keyes selects 36 test subjects, all conscientious objectors who still want to serve their country. Each was in good shape, all had some college, each of them averaged 153 pounds in weight, and Keyes systematically starved them. Each man got about 1,500 calories per day, about what the Germans were getting, and they walked for miles each day, just like the Germans had to do who had no transportation infrastructure. Staffers quickly recorded a loss in the strength, speed, and coordination of each man, and starvation begins to take its toll. Body temperatures dropped from a normal 98.6 to 95.8, almost three full degrees. Resting heart rate dropped from 55 beats per, per minute to 35 beats per minute. The lowest recorded beats per minute was 28. Uh, also evident was edema, or the distended belly that we associate with starvation, was also evident in some. And additionally, scientists dra uh, uh, tracked three drives, the need for sex, the need for activity, and the need for food. Sex drive diminished within weeks, and every one of the men stopped dating. And then apathy was soon evident afterwards. The men simply didn't care about what was going on around them. However, concern for food was paramount. They all dreamed about it. They planned how to get more of it. And they tried to alleviate hunger pains that they experienced every day. By the end of the starvation phase, overall fitness for each man had dropped by an average of 72%. The group had lost, on average, 37 pounds, with each man down to about 115 pounds, losing almost 25% of his body weight. On average, each man lost a third centimeter in height, the average heart had shrunk 17%, and the liver and intestines of each man had shrunk also. When the human body experiences starvation, it will shut off calories to the major organs, causing them to atrophy. What was hardest to quantify was the apathy. The men had no strength to do labor, and they simply didn't care about it. So German manufacturing can't get up and running without food. The sign reads, we want coal, we want bread. German miners didn't get enough calories to mine coal necessary for heating homes and running factories. Coal miners needed over 4,000 calories per day to mine coal. And even though they got a special ration for their demanding physical labor, it was never enough. Their, their daily ration was just over 2,000 calories, and most miners brought the food home and shared it with their families. This affected morale and productivity because tens of thousands of Germans got frostbite each winter because they had nothing with which to heat their homes. So to meet the food challenges of 1947, the Truman administration set up the Citizens Food Committee, but kept all ties to the government hid hidden. This was not the old famine emergency committee. Here's President Truman on the left and Charles Luckman on the right, who is the head of the Citizens Food Committee. And he, the two of them give the first press conference in the history of the White House explaining the need to save grain for Europe. Not only did they again ask people to voluntarily save bread for shipment overseas, but they took a much tougher approach in collecting grain for shipment. They shut down the distillery industry uh, for 90 days. They got the baking industry to use less grain, and they asked the poultry industry to produce fewer eggs and frying chickens. The most effective way to save grain, Luckman said, was to institute various days of the week where they would give up eggs, poultry, and other meats. For example, Americans were asked to give up meat, beef and pork, on Tuesdays, and eggs and poultry on Thursdays. The committee said this would save grain by driving, da driving down the demand for these items. However, the poultry, meat, beef, and pork industry said, actually, that's going to 
drive up our consumption of grain because we're going to have to feed these animals for a much longer time as, as demand drops. But what the committee is actually trying to do was to force the various industries into reducing the number of eggs and chickens and hogs and cattle produced overall by cutting into their profit margins. The committee dropped the meatless and eggless days, and in exchange, the Livestock Committee actually came up with reasonable plans to save grain. Overall, the effort is fairly successful, getting huge reductions in eggs and poultry especially, and they also got the pork and cattle industries to ship livestock at leaner weights, saving grain for shipment to Germany. The Truman administration met not only that basic 450,000 bushels of, of wheat, but also met that 100,000 additional bushels of wheat by being pretty heavy-handed with, uh, with American industry. All right, so people didn't want to go without bread, but they would donate grain if they were asked. Drew Pearson was a well-known journalist in 1947 who envisioned the greatest display of Cold War pageantry at the time. He envisioned a train traveling from Los Angeles to New York, picking up donated food as it went. People from all walks of life, rural and urban, contributed to the effort. Small towns arranged for a rail car full of condensed milk, wheat, flour, or dried beans or macaroni for shipment overseas. When the train stopped to collect boxcars, people gave speeches about the effort, which generated a lot of excitement. Pearson hoped to collect 80 boxcars full of food. His train collected over 100, but he got 800 rail cars full of food after six more trains copied the effort and hit areas that the friendship train had missed. The main thing Pearson wanted to do was to put signs on the food so that the Europeans would understand that it was donated by Americans. As the communists took credit for much of the food that was previously sent in plain white sacks. He called this the friendship train. The friendship train sent its contents to France and Italy because of the large numbers of communists in the national government there. The Truman administration and Pearson wanted to demonstrate to the people in Italy and France that the Americans had not forgotten them and would not allow them to starve. More importantly, they wanted to undermine pro communist propaganda. Later, the copycat trains that sent their food to Germany, helping to send enough food there to keep people from starving. The people of France were so thankful for the food that they arranged a merci train, or a thank you train. They took old 40 and 8 boxcars, called that because they could fit 40 soldiers and 8 horses, and the French collected donations from around the country. People sent books, clothing, hats, pictures, etc., loaded them into these boxcars, and one went to each of the 48 states. Here is the boxcar sent to Kansas. It's now located in Hayes. The Missouri Friendship Train is in the Dakota Land Museum in Sedalia. Between the Friendship Train and the Citizens Food Committee, Germans continued to receive uh, that 1,500 calories per day. All right, so the United States might have continuously, or might have had to continuously feed German, uh, Germany indefinitely, except for three significant programs that got Germany back on its feet and able to produce enough food for itself. First, the Marshall Plan sent $13 billion to rehabilitate the European economy, of which $1.4 billion went to Germany. This allowed them to fix the transportation problems, ramp up their agricultural programs, and factories increased manufacturing, which allowed them to use the money from exports to pay for imported food. This set the stage for Germany to produce enough food on its own. Today, Germany produces so much wheat that it actually ex ex exports some of it. The second thing that, the, that they do, that we do, is currency reform in the western zones in early 1948, which gives farmers the confidence that they needed in the national money. They were, they were no longer afraid to trade their commodities for cash and move Germany away from the barter system that had arisen. Food that had been hidden and hoarded away previously suddenly appeared on grocery store shelves in the cities. 
The communists absolutely hated this currency reform as it only applied to the Western zones and it signaled to the Soviets the American willingness to go our own way in creating West Germany. In the long term, this ushered in a Cold War that lasted decades. Finally, the creation of West Germany and NATO in 1949 was key to giving the Germans the confidence that Europe and America would not abandon Germany to the Soviets. Nobody envisioned a Soviet invasion of Western Europe in, in the late 1940s, but many were afraid that the Germans would trade their freedom for bread. Italy and France had many members of the Communist parties in their central government, and many feared that the Germans would do the same. Knowing that the United States stood beside them gave Germany the confidence to reject Soviet uh, communism. In the Western zones, the food problem is largely solved by October of 1948. Berlin was a little bit different story, though, as the fixes that the Western zones enjoyed hadn't reached Berlin. All of the food that the people in Berlin consumed had to be brought in from the Western zones, and there was never enough of it. In response to the Marshall Plan, currency reform, and the ne negotiations for the creation of West Germany and NATO, the Soviets cut off all rail, road, and barge traffic coming into Berlin in June 1948. The city was already short of food, and the Soviet objective was to starve the Berliners into submission and to push the Allies out of Berlin and ultimately out of Germany. This didn't happen. President Truman simply resolved to remain in Berlin, and the Allies had stumbled upon the fact that an airlift could supply the city. At first, nobody thought that it would work simply because it never had before. But over time, the airlift brought in everything the city needed to survive and it was in place for over a year when the Soviets simply lifted the blockade. It was a humiliating defeat for them. The experience brought the Americans and the Germans closer together than ever before and the two nations continue as close allies even today. In conclusion then, between 1945 and 1948, the United States and the British did not give in to the temptation to bring about a punitive peace on Germany. This may have been satisfying initially, but to do so might have brought about a third world war. It was neither in our value system nor in our interest to starve the Germans after World War II. Likewise, we would not allow the Soviet Union to absorb another sovereign nation into their orbit where we could prevent it. And so if anybody has any easy questions, <laughs> I would be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. One uh, quick reminder, if you do have questions, please, if you would, use the microphones down here at the front so the folks in the audience and the people watching at home can hear the question as well as the answer. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but a good many Americans are of German descent, quite a large number. I heard that a third of the American army in Europe was Germanic descent. Obviously, the commander in chief was named Eisenhower. Was the fact that a lot of Americans were of Germanic descent, did that, do you, maybe you never looked into it, but did that create maybe a little more sympathy um, for Germany because so many Americans are of, of Germanic descent? Uh, good question, thanks. Uh, no, I did not see any instances specifically where, Ger where, Ameri excuse me, where American or allied sol American soldiers were doing anything because of their German Germanic uh, descent. Um, German, or, uh, American soldiers stationed in Germany at the time uh, of the, of, at the end of the war were, were simply moved by the, uh, the vision of, the, of people starving to death. You saw, the, uh, you saw the pictures of the Americans who were undergoing the, um, the, the starvation experiments. Seeing that day after day, I think, drove a whole lot of people. But having, uh, I don't think that there was a, a big drive on the part of the soldiers, but we start establishing sister cities in the United States immediately after the war to start helping specific cities in Germany. For example, where I'm from in Worthington, Minnesota, we have a, uh, we have a sister city, Kralsheim, Germany, which was identified for us 
by the State Department as a, as a city about our same size. It's also an agricultural area, and, and we were teamed up. And, and we, my, my hometown, my uh, town in Worthington, Minnesota, sent thousands of pounds of shoes and clothes and food packages and, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, I, I think there, there might have been a, a little bit of that. But more, I think, was simply driven by uh, the desire to do the right thing. So thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, my father-in-law, who is of German descent, by the way, my Ohio native, um, he was in the 99th Infantry Division. And uh, after the, I've heard about this, I don't know how long he stayed in the occupation forces, whenever that division, but he was there in the summer of 45. And of course, they were given cigarettes, which he didn't use. And uh, he established a relationship with a young German boy named Herbert Hoffman, um, eight or 10 years old, and he gave him the cigarettes, and he could trade them for eggs and all kinds. These were good American cigarettes, not the crappy <laughs> German cigarettes. Anyway, right. he uh, later emigrated to Canada, to Toronto, be, opened a German restaurant, and we had the opportunity in the early 70s, his daughter, my wife, and I to go up there and eat at the rest, or see him, and he'd become a, a Ministry of Tourism honcho. But anyway, so there was one example of uh, GIs just reaching out. Is right. He, they, the kids would come to the fence and chocolate bars and cigarettes are worth a fortune. Yeah, it'd be because the currency was absolutely yeah. worthless. I mean, uh -huh. so, uh, so to your point, um, uh, who knows how long he would have been there, but they are, they are sending all kinds of GIs out of Europe pretty quickly to the, to the Pacific Theater because that's still going on. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, interesting about this relationship and, and confirmation, which is always nice mm -hmm. when you're up here giving a, a talk about, hey, am I, am I really right about this? Well, it's, it's nice when you have confirmation that what you're telling people is actually right. Thank so, you. thank you. Mac. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, um, was, it, was that... Was there a lot of resentment from from the from the Amer was there like widespread resentment from the American people back home as in as in like oh as in like as in like as in like as in like oh as in like, as in like, as in like oh my goodness we got to we spent all all the war making all these sacrifices ration all this food and now we've won the war and we have to and we have to keep doing it just to feed just to feed our our erstwhile enemy no thanks let him starve I'm sure that was a very common sentiment. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so remember that, that happy, lucky story that I just told you about my hometown in Worthington? Yeah, half the population wanted nothing to do with this, with this program, sending food and clothing and that to, to, uh, to Germany. Um, and, uh, but not only, not only in the United States, but also in Germany itself. The, the Americans and the Germans were not very close for, for uh, and it's going to take several years of the American effort to feed Germany and getting the Germans to understand that, hey, this is a, a voluntary thing. We're doing this uh, it, it, not because we have to, but because we want to. And Germans start understanding that the, the, the choices before them, like, hey, you, you can be invaded by the Soviets or, or you can be invaded by the Americans. You, it's up to you, which you can actually choose. You can, and so the, the a whole lot of people chose this uh, relationship with, with the Americans to live to move to the western zones where the where, and not just the Americans but the Allies as well, and uh, and so over the course of a number of years, particularly the uh, the people in Berlin after the Berlin airlift. Uh, starts putting, putting to the side a whole lot of that uh, animosity, which was absolutely there on both sides at the, uh, at the beginning of the occupation. So, Matt, hey, quick shout out to some of my students who have come here from the Command and General Staff College. Thanks for showing up, John. Okay. So, the United States was rather isolationist going into World War I and then kind of drug into World War II again. Yeah. Um, and now all of a sudden the U.S. is providing food aid and other diplomatic efforts and becoming more of a global player. That's kind of the transition into the U.S. as a global power. Where do you see these food influences and uh, agricultural diplomacy influencing U.S. foreign policy now and in the future? So, hey, great question. Uh, great class participation as well. So, Extra points. <laughs> 
extra points for, for sure, and for teeing up such such a, a relevant question. Nice, nice job. Yeah. So, so the Truman administration figures out pretty quickly that they're onto something with this soft power. How do you turn a, a, an enemy into a friend? Well, you do things like you feed starving populations, and and you. Uh, and, and you uh, start helping people out, get the, uh, the economy back up and running, right? We, we learned the, pro the, the problem of a punitive peace after World War I, how that doesn't work out very well. That's why we did something, and, and Truman does something fundamentally different after World War II. And so they figure out that this is a winning combination. America's got tons of food. We've got the best farmers in the world willing to, to go out and, and, and work from, you know, work themselves to death to, to uh, provide food for the Amer American people. And so before the war, we've got grainies, granaries just absolutely stuffed full of commodities that the government is buying in order to keep prices up and keep farmers out of the poorhouse. And so after the war, we've got granaries full of, full of uh, wheat and corn and all kinds of, of commodities again. And so we figure out, you know what we can do with all this excess food? We can ship this overseas to starving people. And we can allow them to use their own local currency to purchase this food so that we can then invest that local currency back into their local markets. And it's, it's something that we've, we've done uh, well, throughout the 50s and the 60s, particularly called the the de you know the 60s was called the decade of development, and so we absolutely had programs to do that. Then Vietnam comes along, and and we we establish teams to go in there and economically and, and agriculturally develop places there. And more recently in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've got the USAID agency, who less than one percent of the of the U.S. budget is designed to put some thought into how do we help uh, nations around the world develop economically and agriculturally? How do we keep people from starving to death? And what are some of those things that we can do? So absolutely, uh, isolationists, we're, we're willing to sell you stuff, you know, before World War II, but afterwards, it really becomes a part of our foreign policy um, kit bag, if you will. And so yeah, it, we're, we're absolutely still doing it today. Great question, Mac. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I find the level of altruism that America showed after World War II to be remarkable. I mean, a half million GIs died in the war. I mean, we all know how bad a person Hitler was. And right. So it's kind of, kind of following up on these last two questions. I do see some parallels beginning to develop now with how are we going to, uh, for example, rebuild Ukraine. Um, how can we, as a society, uh, kind of regain that sense of altruism and deny you know, uh, this whole America First thing really bothers me. And yeah. it seems to be very short-sighted, but it, like the guy two, two questions ago was saying, you know, that's America, uh, he was recognizing the benefit of not pursuing America, uh, an America First policy. How, how can we best learn from that experience and translate that to future success? Wow, if only I had an answer to, to that one. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm gonna say, so I'm just gonna start talking until I think of something <laughs> relevant. No, you, you bring up a, a great point because, because we were, as a nation, I, I think there was a, a, a poll done in uh, July of 1945 uh, I, where, don't, don't quote me on this, I think it was 75% of all of the Americans polled were willing to give up food uh, in order to make sure that there was food available to ship overseas. But th I, I think there, you're right, there's been a fundamental shift in our understanding of uh, th some of the key points that I was hitting was uh, values, excuse me, values and interests. Is it in our value system to, to provide food to people? Uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, nobody likes to see people starving, so yeah, it's probably in our value system, but is it in our interest, which requires a whole lot more dedication, like somebody's got to pay for this stuff. And so uh, I'm, I'm hearing on the news lately about how there is this uh, de desire to, to cut back on, on the uh, foreign investment, and I, I, I'm no expert on it, I'm just 
saying in, in 1945 to 1948, it paid huge dividends outside of just keeping people alive because this is the start of the Cold War and we've also got a vested interest in, in containing communism. And if the communists can promise, like, uh, you know, like General Clay said, there's no choice in being a uh, believer in democracy on a thousand calories when the communists can provide you 1,500. So it's, it's just, somebody's got to convince folks that it's in our value system and in our interest to, to help people. Um, outside of that, I, 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 I don't know, I don't know what, to, what to say really, but a yeah, great point. I mean, we're seeing Ukraine and, and all of the problems there, the, the, you know, there, there are shortages in food around the world uh, as a ripple effect of what's, what's going on there. So, I'm going to jump in real quick and say we'll finish up with these three people that are at the microphone. And then, David, are you willing to stick around for a few minutes if there's additional questions? Sure. Excellent. Sure. Thank you for your presentation. I rise yes, as a military officer with a farming background with a genetics father, genetics father who got on an airplane from the Marshall Plan and left a wife with a two-month-old baby and off to Europe went. But I rise because our government competes and food prevents war. And it's absolutely key that we think in broader terms when we compete as you have so eloquently done. As the United States gives its expertise as it did when the wall fell down in more ways than just agriculture yeah. reaching out to help, uh, we compete on a broad ground and we have humanitarian hearts. And I think we need to remind ourselves of, of our overall competition, remember humanity, and our national security depends a lot on food. For many of us who are Vietnam era, we were a little appalled when we learned that the Green Revolution came seven years too late. If the Green Revolution had come seven years earlier, we would not have had the Vietnam War because the Vietnam War was because the North needed the rice in the South. We can talk about politics all you want, but uh, food and those who contribute to seeing that there is food make a mighty contribution to our national security. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, sir. That, that is a great point. And to your point, food has been used through, from, from the beginning of time as both a bridge between societies and as a weapon of war. Um, so, yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, my father was a war correspondent during World War II. He was working for WLS in Chicago, which was owned by Prairie Farmer Magazine. He was over there for like six months. I wondered if you could talk about whether you are aware of any influence on the part of broadcast journalism right after the war in America to influence people in one direction or the other toward accepting uh, the programs that you've been talking about? So, yes, uh, to, make, to make a long story shorter. So we tend to, to look at, uh, you know, Germany has a minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. Hey, we've got them too in, throughout the war. There's an office of war information, folks who are, are designed to, or whose job it is to put out, um, put out good news stories, right, on what's going on in the war. But to your point, what some of the programs that I'm talking about is uh, during the war, the, the Advertising Council, which is a, uh, a conglomeration of, of media organizations, in, during World War II, that's, they get together and, and generate these, uh, a whole lot of good news stories. Well, they are absolutely a pivotal part of, of the Citizens Food Committee and the uh, Famine Emergency Committee that I'm talking about. And a whole lot of these efforts are donated. Uh, newspapers giving up you know, uh, space for advertising for free. And uh, when I mentioned that there were, you know, all these radio spots and, and newspapers and, and billboards, all of these folks are giving up, um, giving up advertising space for free. There, so afterwards, after World War II, there is a concerted anti-communist effort on the part of the media in the United States. And it is, is absolutely brought in to, to play its part in, in this sort. 
So yes, sir, thank you. My question has to do with verifying something uh, about uh, Herbert Hoover. I grew up in a big family and my parents always dressed to us, it, you know, you wanna be, belong to the clean plate club. <laughs> and I know, you know, like you said, Herbert Hoover was big into all these humanitarian food things. And I believe I read somewhere that he was, before he became president, he was depart he was uh, secretary of the interior or something like that. Uh, commerce, I believe. And I also read somewhere that he came up with that term or that program, the Clean Plate Club. And I'm just wondering if you could verify that for me. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, that was part of, I mean, the, the guy only was in charge of like six different national and international organizations to provide food for people. But when I said that, uh, hey, he's like, it said in World War II, let, let's start this famine emergency committee and, and tell people what we need because it worked in World War I. Yeah, what he was doing was, was asking people to only take what you want, but eat everything on your plate, right? So which would, uh, which would help to save grain and, and other food items for, uh, for, for the war effort or for these, these nations that were uh, hit as a result of, of the wars. So yes, Herbert Hoover was absolutely the founding, founding father of the Clean Plate Club. I'd like to throw that out. That's a great trivia question <laughs> for people, because I don't think too many people know that he was the creator of the Clean Plate Club. Nor that he was, was such the, the humanitarian. I mean, you, um, that, that is not what you hear about these days when you hear about Herbert Hoover. So. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much for sticking with us to the fire alarm. And thank you, David Mills.